Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. This is Matthew Raphael Johnson. We are at uh, the beginning of April, Holy Week of 2018. Um, today I want to talk about someone um, extremely important to us, both uh, uh, Orthodox people and, and and nationalists, someone who doesn't get talked about a lot. He doesn't get talked about a lot because the regime has trouble labeling him. They call him a fascist, a word that really doesn't have much meaning. Um, but he was quite different from from the rest of them. He was more like Franco than uh, than Hitler. And remember that that um, national socialism and fascism are, are related, but are far from identical. Uh, and we're talking about uh, Ionis or John Metaxas, Greek military man who ruled the country um, from 1936 to 1941. He was born in 1871 uh, and was a convinced monarchist and orthodox struggler his entire life. In Greek life, there's something called really the Great Schism or the Great Divide. And it's been in existence a lot longer than, than World War I. But in the 20th century, anyway, it's between those who support the British governed parliament and the more German leaning monarch. It was about German interests versus English interests. It was about the landed power versus the British sea power. Two completely different, irreconcilable people. And Greek life has never quite recovered from that. The man, the, the rather nefarious man who created this, that Aetherios uh, Venizelos, one of the biggest names in, in early 20th century politics, who is without fail lionized with, with the most uh, almost erotic language, against um, Metaxas, who, simply because they label him a fascist, you know, it really doesn't matter what he did after that. The labels are a substitute for knowledge today. Um, but if Metaxas is a fascist, well, then I guess that's what I am. Uh, I'm not subject to, to people calling me names. Um, but royalism versus parliamentarism is an essential component here again. Let's be very clear. You know, I've spent a good chunk of my life studying classical Greek political thought, and there was nothing democratic about the Athenian constitution. It took a lot of work to be a citizen and to maintain your position as citizen. You were a professional citizen. You had to be knowledgeable. You had to be uh, philosophically minded. Um, it wasn't just anybody. You had to be able to bear arms. This is a sort of democracy that Greece gave to the world. You had to be a moderate property. You had to be a yeoman. Um, the Greek origins of of um, uh, liberal democracy, something like that. Uh, the book, an excellent work, showing this. It's not it's not liberal democracy in the sense that we know it today. I'm uh, oh, sorry. The the, the uh, Greek agrarian origins of liberty. That's it. And the big difference between freedom and liberty, that's also part of this great divide. This great divide existed, you know, at least since the, the uh, late Turokratia. And unfortunately, this divide is to be found in most societies. But Greece is in an anomalous position because it is a sea power with a deeply orthodox tradition. It is extremely strategic. And so, during World War I, the British were obsessed with it. As most of you know, the, the British were, this the same group of people were heavily involved in uh, promoting the new calendar. Um, and the who, who uh, the Patriarch, who was deposed, a uh, high-level Mason, it's not, it shouldn't surprise you that uh, Venezuela is, is a high-level, 33rd degree Mason. 
and um, Metaxas is not. But in 1915, the issue in Greece um, was over participation in the First World War. Greece was seen as very strategic because, they, and ultimately what happened, and this is what very, very few people know, and I keep forgetting about, that the Allies invaded Greece. Um, this battle wasn't uh, going to be settled anytime soon. Uh, and Greece being neutral, you know, the, the monarch was, was pro-neutrality. Uh, I believe most of the military was pro-neutrality. Um, but to be on the Allied side, you know, essentially, you know, the, the British wanted to, to, um, use the Greeks to fight for the British Empire. That's what the Russians were for. Um, you know, this division is, has plagued a, a Greek society. Um, but Metaxas made it very clear, uh, being a military man, being educated in, in very prestigious institutions, that if she would intervene on the British side in Asia Minor, um, it would take men away from the front guarding against Bulgaria. And then the Turkish population in the heartland of Asia Minor would create all kinds of problems. It would weaken and destabilize the army and would, would stretch it out far too, far too great. Now, Venezuelus is, is always uh, trumpeted as this great believer in liberal democracy and freedom and progress. But there isn't a place in the world where this kind of government hasn't come into existence by the barrel of a gun. And Greek is no different. Uh, Greece is no different. In August of 1916, group of lawyer, uh, officers loyal to him uh, staged a coup in Thessaloniki. And then they created a new government, the government of national defense, under his uh, control. And it was a sort of a British landed oligarchy at the time. So in 1916, you had two countries called Greece, the government of national defense and in Thessaloniki and the uh, Greek uh, crown in Athens about half the country, with full Allied support. Um, and then they entered the war on, on the Allied side. Um, 1916, the Allies invaded Greece and attacked Athens because this was the seat of the, of the, of the crown. Um, the Greek army was actually quite confused as to what was going on here. And Venezuelos was then installed by, by the Allies afterwards. He was a tool of British intelligence. He was a tool of British capital. Um, the Greek economy was perpetually in crisis, although that was to change under Metaxas. Uh, and it was because Venezuelos had to, you know, was constantly uh, uh, keeping um, Greece in debt, floating new loans. Um, it, in a few years, uh, almost half of the Greek budget was for debt service. Metaxas, the great nationalist leader, said, we're not going to pay anymore. And that was it. He said, we can't do it. It's going to destroy the country. I didn't contract this debt. It's not a legitimate contract anyway. I'm not going to pay you. Well, they could either invade the country again or simply swallow it. Metaxas is called an authoritarian. And it's, again, one of these stupid labels that has absolutely no meaning. Every modern government, I don't care what the ruling ideology is, every modern government functions exactly the same. Every modern government has a bureaucracy that's organized and suborganized into departments with specialized bureaucrats. It will be the same people there no matter if it was elected or not elected. They're the ones who matter. They carry policy out. They're the ones you have to deal with. It doesn't make any difference if their bosses are elected or not. And it makes even less difference when those bureaucrats are in fact unionized and impossible to fire like in the U.S. 
the concept of authoritarian doesn't make any sense. Um, my Harper Collins Dictionary of Philosophy says, and it actually kind of has, it's, it's an odd definition, it's the obedience to a single source of authority that is beyond question, as opposed to the individual pursuit of truth. That's a very odd definition because it's talking about the nature of the authority itself as being singular. One of the reasons I think they define it that way is because you can't bring modernity under that because there's certainly more than one center of authority. Um, you know, and as opposed to individual pursuits, like abstract individuals that's assigned to, to pursue these things. But like all of these labels and all of these definitions, it's meaningless. Governments are exactly the same, no matter where they are. Leaders are the same, whether they're installed, or whether they're elected or not. You know, the, uh, and the people who work for them are exactly the same. And a leader is only as good as the people who are, who are working for them. Anyway, um, after this invasion of Greece, and to bring uh, Venizelos in and uh, the Masonic Lodge into Athens, the barrel of the gun. Um, they overthrew King Constantine, and Venizelos uh, dutifully declared war in, in 1917. Now, these events uh, saw Metaxas as the head of the pro-royalist forces, and around that same time, of course, uh, King Constantine was deposed, and, um, and you know, I, I should note as well, Venizelos had came to power prior to this in 1909 in another coup. So this paragon of Masonic democracy came to power in at least two coup d'etat in, uh, in Greek history. But, but things get worse here. The end of the war, the Ottoman state, Turkey, is no more. It had been backed and, and artificially held together by the British and the French for a very, very long time as a way to maintain uh, their control over the Balkans. But Ataturk takes over, embarrassed by the, the Sultanate disappearing, creates a more or less secular state, also a high-level Freemason. And because of, and what's happening now, the, the royal house in Greece will be restored. It won't take long before the, the royal house is restored. It's always very popular. France and Britain then refuse to support Greece and back Ataturk. 1919, the Greek army is defeated at Smyrna in August. The British gave intelligence and supplies to, to Ataturk's army. And they also had an ally in the USSR. On May 3rd, the Soviet government handed over um, 33,500,000 gold rubles to Turkey. In 1922, from where? Where could they have possibly had not only you know, 33 million gold rubles, but to give away in 1922? These networks are everywhere. Ataturk and Venizelos knew one another. They're a member of the same lodge together. Because they received Soviet assistance and intelligence and a huge amount of money, Greek, uh, uh, British and French intelligence and supplies. The Greek army lost. They had to evacuate uh, Anatolia, Eastern Thrace, Tenidos, and it is what, we, what is more or less well known, the population exchange between Greece and Turkey. Um, about uh, almost two million people uprooted. You know, Orthodox come to Greece, Muslims go to the new state. At the defeat of the Greek army, we have what's called the Great Smyrna Fire, which I think is the, the uh, um, um, or the Greek Vespers. Turkish army rampaged that port city. Uh, they were permitted to do so by the British. This was punishment for their support of um, the monarch. Smyrna was also a refugee center. You had about 2 million Greeks and Armenians 
living there in temporary refugee camps. Tens of hundreds of thousands were murdered. At the defeat of the Greek army, they come into Smyrna, they see all these helpless people, and um, due to their, you know, spirits being very high, their hatred of the Greeks, the being egged on by, by the world's great powers, being justified, uh, drugs were used, alcohol was used, they slaughtered uh, hundreds of thousands of Greeks and Armenians in Smyrna. Kemal Ataturk claimed no responsibility for this for the following reason. He said, my forces, my air force dropped leaflets all over my, my armed camps that death will come to anyone who harms a non-combatant, a civilian. Well, except for one small thing. It was written in Greek. It was a trick. And he said, we have no responsibility. I ordered my men that they may not do this. And I guarantee you very few Turks were killed as a result. This is what happens when the monarchy is overthrown. This is what happens when you make any deals with the British. The monarchy was overthrown for a short period of time, was restored, and this was a British punishment and the Masonic uh, Lodge's punishment. And now you had a huge number of refugees pouring in from Greek areas of the Middle East. Later on, the 20s, uh, uh, late 20s, there was nothing more than chaos and, and economic uh, downturns in, in, in the Greek state. The national economy was really based on, on luxury agricultural goods like exporting uh, tobacco. Uh, raisins, olive oil, you know. And then these commodities fell, the demand fell, once the Great Depression hit. So the Greek state has lost most of its uh, foreign exchange sources. I shouldn't say the Greek state, this is Greek capital. Venizelos, prior to this, had negotiated, is one of his claims to be one of his great. Uh, Accomplishments, the negotiation of a, a nine million pound loan to restructure Greek infrastructure and in the economy. He um, entered into the same gold standard that the uh, British were on. He purged the Greek bank, Greek central bank, and handed it over to its creditors, the English. There was tremendous um, insider speculation on the drachma of the Greek currency. 1932, debt was about 150% of GDP. And as I said before, about half of the budget was paying interest on the debt. But around that same time, the British left the gold standard. There was a massive drop in production in demand, both external and internal. And Venizelos, is typical of, of his ilk, centralized power. He banned opposition newspapers, banned opposition uh, gatherings. He sought a temporary dictatorship. Now, you saw this in, in Russia under Yeltsin. Everything that the regime condemns Putin for, they ordered Yeltsin to do at one point. When Yeltsin was in trouble... He was told to centralize authority, to not listen to the to the Congress. Putin has been criticized for um, not permitting the open election of regional governors. That these governors are now being installed from Moscow uh, with a vote from the local legislature. The point, of course, was to control the local strongmen. He's been condemned. For that, he's still being condemned for it, even though it's you know a decade-old policy. The only problem is, is that that was a U.S. idea. The Americans had ordered uh, Yeltsin to do the exact same thing in the mid-90s. He did not do it. The point is, liberalism, the state, it doesn't make any difference. They're all authoritarians. 
liberals will talk in universal terms about, you know, these ridiculous you know, rights and all this other garbage. And they will use the most violent possible means to come to power and to keep power. Once the monarchy was restored, there were at least two other coup attempts from officers in the pay of, of the British government. Venizelos was directly implicated, and he retired, eventually had to flee to Paris, and he died in 1936 in disgrace. He was a miserable failure. He created the Greek stock market. It was just a way for British oligarchs to speculate on the Greek currency. He tried to create this liberal Greece, and liberalism just means enthrall to capital, English capital, in this particular case, and France to a lesser extent. Now, more than once, actually in 1935, it occurred before, where liberals had won an election. The monarch said this election is false. It's based on fraud. There's money coming in from uh, British intelligence. I'm going to nullify it. 1935. um, And this happened happened more than once. And the Crown, of course, was quite right that nothing happened. The Liberal Party, which Venezuela has founded, is a Masonic party, very much like the cadets in, in Russia. Um, and now had the English actually directly controlling um, the banks and, and everything else. Um, won the won the election in by a huge margin, kind of a suspiciously large margin. The monarch nullified it, changed the law to make sure that no uh, external money could come in, and had another election a few months later. The Liberal Party then boycotted that election. They've done this, you know, this has occurred in in the past. This happened also in in, uh, in 1915, um, where Venezuelos had, you know, done everything fair or foul to get Greece to bleed for Great Britain. Um... Because these elections uh, contained a tremendous amount of influence from the British, the Crown, following his absolute um, uh, authority and, and the property, you know, he, he had the right to do this as part of why a monarch is there, said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cancel this. We're going to have another one. Everything is the same, except I'm going to make sure that there are, there's no foreign money coming in. The Liberal Party then boycotts the election. They've done this twice. Now, my question is simply this. If it's a legitimate election and you've won fairly, then why boycott it? Why don't you just win again? It shouldn't be a problem. And, of course, they never did. We don't really know. That's the point of the boycott. The boycott isn't so much to to protest. It's to disguise what really would have happened. Boycotting elections is a, is a, is a dirty trick because you now you don't know what would have happened. They don't want to expose themselves to, to that kind of embarrassment. But the thing is, in, in the Greek parliament, you had the liberals and the populists, uh, fighting against each other. They're typical political parties. The Greek economy is disappearing. And like you had in Spain, like you had in Germany, like you had in Portugal, like you had in Romania, nothing was done. Protest was being directed at the state when, in fact, it should have been directed at corporations, people who actually mattered in this regard. The state, and I've said this before, has this, there's this weird superstition that governments control economy. Outside of the Soviet Union, that's simply not the case. In fact, Venezuelos created a state that is uh, the, the, the handmaiden to capital. 
I, I did a lecture some time ago uh, here on, on Albania. I remember very well when the pyramid scheme there collapsed in the 90s. And there were riots and attacks on the parliament house. Attacks on the police. Attacks on the presidential. And I said, wait a minute. What? The, the pyramid scheme was purely private. What are they attacking cops for? What are they attacking government agencies for? You have this b- bizarre thing. And, and really, for capital, especially British capital, the state, or I should say, sorry, politicians are there to take the blame when things go wrong. That's really their job. They could be enriched when things go well, but they're there to diffuse the hatred that they have. Um, it's the government that forced us to bail out the banks, not the banks. It's a way to direct attention, and people are dumb enough that they truly believe that governments and liberal democracies control the economy. Whether, in fact, it's, it's the other way around. I remember hearing Bernie Sanders at the election talking about how he was going to regulate the banks and put them under control. And I said, well, with what? The money that the state that you're going to be president of is using comes from the banks. You don't have that power. The banks are more powerful than you are. You can't regulate banks. Banks regulate you. Unless you have a full revolution from the ground up, you're in no position to regulate anybody. And you're going to learn that if you get elected. Well, I respected Bernie. I didn't like I respected him. Did not like or respect Hillary. I know way too much about her. Anyway, that's and this is happening in Greece now. Attacking the state somehow has something to do with fixing the economy. States don't fix economies. Um, so in the 30s, Greece is disappearing. The Communist Party is growing. They're getting support from the Soviet Union. They're getting support from the U.S. Um, the British is doing everything it can to destabilize the situation to make sure that their investments, their heavy investments, are safe. Their big roadblock is the crown, which they were doing anything humanly possible to overthrow. The crown, King George at this time, appointed Metaxas, who in 1935 was Minister of War and then Prime Minister, into the position of... of um, Leader of the state, and he dismissed parliament. With, with, you know, and no one even noticed. You know, it may be condemned as an authoritarian move, but nothing was happening there anyway. In May of thirty-six, the labor uh, unrest and riots had paralyzed the the, the the Greek state and the Greek world, and because of this. And clear Soviet and, and American involvement in tax on the crown, um, very much like you had in South Korea in 1987. Metaxas declared, quite rightly, a state of emergency. He sent the politicians home. I'm sure they had to hide themselves as soon as they got there. And did what the Nizalos tried to do many, many years earlier, and that is to centralize authority. The state was under siege. And just like in South Korea, you have a small government under siege from much bigger forces. It has no other choice but to do that. I should note that it was Venezuelos several, several years before this who had outlawed labor unions, or at least their collective bargaining. In the early 30s, inflation was running rampant. Industrial production was falling. Um... There was a fall in real incomes and, of course, a very weak uh, imposition of tariffs. Exports fell, you know, um, by 20 million American dollars. Um, 1934, both exports and imports were 45% lower than the 1931 levels. So the country then went through a, a process of, of complete disintegration. There were four meaningless elections, 32, 33, 35, and 36, assassination attempts, 
the boycott, I mentioned the 1935 boycott already, and no fewer than four coups and attempted coups. This is why Metoxicus took power. He didn't take power because he didn't have anything else to do that day. He didn't take power for his own enjoyment. He never sought it before. The crown was desperate. The Greek society was desperate. Metoxas was appointed as the only man, popular enough, intelligent enough, he was from the common people, he can put a lid on all of this. The debt, the, the inflation, out of control. In port cities, which were always very politically active in the Greek world, riots and fires were on a regular basis. Usury was everywhere because you have desperate farmers who need an influx of funds for the, before the next harvest, and every kind of, of loan shark shows up, both institutional and non-institutional. And of course, they're still dealing with the refugee problem from the Middle East. In this case, Greek refugees, a legitimate issue. This is one of the first things that Metaxas says when he takes power. We must subordinate our appetites our passions and our egoism to the wholeness of the national interest. This way, we will be a really free people. Otherwise, anarchy and indiscipline will reign under the false mask of freedom. And then he also says this about um, parliamentarism. Democracy is characterized by mediocrity. The leaders of democratic regimes are mediocre human beings, servants of foreign, of sovereign masses. But societies truly need superior beings to lead their nations. Democracy derives its strength from amorphous and misguided masses. It's a very important quote because masses aren't citizens. It's a very, very important distinction. Marxists and communists and leftists talk about masses all the time. This faceless crowd. They're not actual people. It's just a, a force that we can manipulate. They're not citizens. It's not the nation. The nation isn't a mass. The nation is far more specific than that. So, 4th of August, 1936. The Toxus takes power. And, of course, the, the name of the, of the state is the 4th of August. With this kind of attitude, Metoxas comes in to repudiate the capitalist system and the bourgeois mentality that it had, uh, that Benizelos had personified. And he was a very strong supporter of corporatism. Now, because we have so few political theorists in the nationalist movement, there is no functional definition of corporatism out there, so allow me to give it. And of course, remember, you know, Metoxas didn't have a long time to put these things into, into place. You have to go to Italy for this, for this notion. Um, the concept, and you see this from the, the finance minister, a horizontal rather than vertical cynical organization. Horizontal referring to actual branches of production, not vertical, which would refer to social classes based on income. If you go to Italy, there is something called the Charter, Charter of uh, Canato, which was um, uh, written in by uh, Gabriel de Annunzio. Um, it's essential to nationalist economics, the so-called uh, Constitution of Fiume. And it was a legal and political framework for the corporation to develop. Corporations represent different sectors of the economy. Representation in the upper house of parliament is based not on population, but on occupational group. What D'Annunzio had written at the time, were, and this is how he divided the economy, industrial and agricultural workers 
which seem awful broad to me. Seafarers, employers, meaning the owners of capital, industrial and agricultural technicians, private bureaucrats and administrators, meaning like middle management, teachers and students, lawyers and doctors, civil servants, and workers of the uh, agricultural cooperation. Here's what D'Annunzio says, the nature of the corporation and hence corporatism. Um, by a corporation, of course, we're referring to a, a union, a very strong uh, union based on a sp- specific area of the economy. He says this, The state represents the aspiration and effort of the people, a community, towards material and spiritual advancement. Only those are full citizens who give their best endeavor to add the wealth and strength of the state. These are one with her in her growth and development. Whatever the kind of work that a man does, whether it be manual or mental, art, industry, design, whatever, he must be a member of one of the ten corporations who receives a general direction from the state as to the scope of their activities, but within those parameters are free to develop them in their own way and to decide among themselves their mutual duties and responsibilities. So these are unions. These are not just political entities. They're economic entities. Now, this first developed in the modern world um, by George William Frederick Hegel. And this was one of the things that uh, Hegel is one of the great uh, nationalist, uh, paleo conservative sort um, uh, writers in, in German history. Uh, Hegel's theory of the corporation is absolutely essential to understanding the philosophy of right. Now, I know Hegel can be very, very difficult, but let me quote him here. And this is his justification, the foundation for the corporation. He says this. This is a section 185 of the philosophy of right. Particularity by itself, given free reign in every direction to satisfy its needs, its caprice, subjective desires, it will destroy itself and its concept and this process of gratification. At the same time, the satisfaction of need, necessary and accidental alike, is accidental because it breeds new desires without end. It is in thoroughgoing dependence on caprice and external accident, and is held in check by the power of universality. And these contrasts in their complexity, civil society affords a spectacle of extravagance and want, as well as the physical and ethical degeneration common to them both. Hegel's view, of course, is is the heart and soul of nationalist economic theory. I've been saying this since I did my master thesis on him in 1994. To unpack this, and actually, as far as Hegel goes, it's one of the clearest uh, passages that he that he ever put together. By particularity, he's referring to individual self-interest that liberal civil society allows it to to gratify whatever need it can afford. But it's a market. That means it's accidental. People um, think they need something where they only want something. Advertisement, uh, PR firms manipulate people into thinking they need something. But over time, this destroys itself. And it destroys itself because it breeds all these new desires that end. And all the while being dependent on just the, whether it be, you know, media or, or our passions or fads or fashions or whatever. And he says it's held in check by the power of universality. That is to say, the nation, the common good, the people. Civil society, liberal society is good when it comes to producing what, what we need. It's terrible ethically. It comes to destroy itself. We're long past that in the United States. Uh, in the 1930s, in Europe, that was being proven everywhere. The extravagance on the one side and want on the other. Um, everything is constituted. It's a part of the state. And remember, the state in continental Europe doesn't refer to the administration. The state refers to the will of the Greek people. 
So this is a collective national will. It's not, you know, government agencies. So the word state is, um, is used to make some of these guys sound bad. Like they're referring to the government. The state doesn't refer to the government. The state actually would refer to the constitution. But Batanx has said that the volition of the Greek people is not just from this era, but from eras previous to this, many thousands of years of history, for Greece in particular. Hegel speaking of this, this random, uh, manipulated desire and passion, and wants are multiplied without end. Well, that might be the people empirically, but that's not who the people really are. Individuals would subordinate their interests and suppress their own appetites and selfishness, especially in times of crisis, for the collective welfare. The only way that they can be free, the only way that they could actually matter as people, as a part of the corporation, which represents them at the federal level. It represents them ethically, it represents them in their occupational group. And there you find the standards for, for um, you know, there's a very powerful legal entity. So you're merging the, the family within the corporation. Otherwise, the individual up against the conglomerate is absolutely nothing and can be trampled with total impunity. Um, therefore, as Hegel will say, there has to be an entity, an intermediate entity, to bring their work to the level of actual universality and ethical life. So on one hand, Metaxas centralizes power in a military and legal sense. But he was smart enough to realize that this is not opposed to decentralization in other regards. He says he's going to, you know, this will ensure the healthy centers of local vitality, culture, and wealth that are built up in the provinces, he said. He has a firm belief in locality. And that this is almost a corporation in and of itself, that these economic cells are regions. And the corporations can function in regions in their own particular way. Um, another way to corporate, these corporations could be called cooperatives. The agricultural cooperative unit was really the foundation for it. Let me uh, give another quote here as far as, um, uh, and this comes from D'Annunzio in the Constitution of Fiume. Each corporation is a legal entity and is recognized by the state. It chooses its own consuls, makes known its decisions, has its own assembly, dictates its terms, decrees and rules, exercises autonomy under the guidance of its own wisdom and experience, provides for its own needs, the management of its own funds, collecting from members a contribution proportion to their wages, professional income, defends in every way its own special interests and wants to improve its status. It aims at bringing to perfection the technique of its own art or calling. It wants to improve the quality of work carried out and to raise the standard of excellence and beauty. It enrolls the humblest of workers, endeavoring to encourage them to do their best work, recognizes the duty of mutual help, decides as to pensions for the sick and infirm, chooses symbols, emblems, music, songs, prayers, Rules, ceremonies, as handsomely as it can, providing enjoyment for the commune, anniversary dinners, sports by land and sea. It venerates its dead, honors its elders, and celebrates its heroes. In a society as deeply alienated as America, this would actually frighten the average person. Um, and yet, what they're describing is a way to overcome the alienation of the mass man. Now, unfortunately, Metaxas, while this was his point of view, given the looming war, uh, was not able to put these uh, into practice to any great extent. Um, but to the extent it was done, it was massively successful. This is not just a form of economic organization. It's also a form of political representation and legal representation. For Hegel, the corporations are represented in the upper house of parliament and are necessary for any law to be passed. And Toxas saw this as a, a new system of representation, 
I mean, it goes beyond proportional representation. It goes beyond population and goes to the heart of people's calling, their vocation. But through this system, the toxic and this failing, miserable economy introduced the minimum wage for the first time in Greek history, created unemployment insurance, and he actually created a public employment agency. He mandated maternity leave, a five-day, 40-hour work week, two-week vacations with pay, very strict work and safety standards, and that's just the beginning. Um, wages increased by 50% between 1935 and 1940. Job creation. Uh, and a lot of this, part me remember too, you know, as Hitler is bringing Germany into uh, economic, uh, the economic stratosphere, these people were intelligent enough to attach their economies to, to his. Um, the German legation to um, Athens says um, the corporatist government reduced those unemployed from um, 1,213,000 to 26,000 in its first 18 months in power. In 1939, according to the Germans, unemployment had fallen to 15,000. It's the same thing that happened in Korea, same thing happened in Germany. It finally stabilized the currency and renationalized the bank. And with that, embarked on a huge program for public works, uh, land drainage, which is very important in Greece, uh, railways, road improvements, and modernization of communications. Uh, between 36 and 38, you had an explosion of Greek economic life. And because Metaxas simply had canceled his debt to the British and to, and to the oligarchs just by saying so, he also forgave a lot of the debt that farmers had. Now, the state always offered interest-free loans uh, to farmers, but as the war is looming, um, he forgives even those debts. For Metaxas, the peasants are the first and primary creators the countryside should never be poisoned by the city, should never be enslaved to the city. The state policy with the peasants were to create a peasant house. And that's not, you know, it, it, the Italians had an industry and peasantry in, in one corporation. For him, there has to be a separate corporation. That the peasant house, so to speak, uh, made up of numerous agricultural cooperatives. And it was put into place in 1939 in Greece. And because they have strict standards and these corporations are internally organized by actual farmers, they brought Greece to self-sufficiency. They improved irrigation, reduced, almost eliminated peasant indebtedness, distributed wasteland, actually brought it under cultivation, and communications. He hated the notion of classes based on money. I believe in class rules, so does he. But classes have nothing to do with your income. It has to do with what you do. The corporate state realizes that all of these corporations need each other to function. Just like organs in the body. Um, but when you organize everything just by money, you automatically have a conflict of interest. Because business owners want to do everything they can to repress wages for the sake of uh, competitiveness. The toxins actually delivered, you know, as, as um, people were going off to the gulags in the Soviet Union, as unemployment was, you know, 40% in the U.S., Germany and um, Greece were actually, you know, approaching uh, the best that, that modern, modern uh, economies can offer. Benazulus had banned labor uh, organization. Here, labor organization was brought into the corporations. Um, health insurance and actually disaster insurance was very important. And the corporations were given money from the state uh, to, do, to do this. Education was a huge part of the corporate state. 
not just in terms of the, the economy, but also its role in society as citizens. The workplace was a place that the was a part of the Greek society, and therefore, even if it was owned by a foreigner, it was under the strict control, under the strict inspection of not only the state, but also the corporation itself. The survival of tradition, he says, is based entirely on the protection of the peasantry. They are a pure people in that they live according, in accordance with natural law. And the minute you step foot in a city, everything starts to change. The fair distribution of wealth within the corporate state was his primary concern. Because capitalism, when it's left alone, leads to oligarchy. Oligarchy then creates the state and other institutions, the media, for its own interests. But corporations don't mean much. I mean, you know, your vocation as, a, as an artist or a writer or, or a policeman um, only goes so far. Why do cooperatives and, and uh, corporations cooperate? And this is where the left has always failed. This is where the anarchists and the Marxists have always failed, because they don't know how to answer that. Why would they, economic class, which, by the way, Marxists have never cared about. Um, that's a, been a, a huge ruse. Workers have never been improved in, under a Marxist uh, system. They never answer the question, why should these cooperatives cooperate? Not just internally, but with each other. They're pieces of a body, and just like different organs would be. They can't function on their own, but what's the body? That's, of course, the nation, based on the language and and the tradition and religion. Nations are created by religions. That's what makes them who they are. On this basis, and with an exploding economy, he brought the lower classes to normal middle class life. Refugees were given land that used to be owned by oligarchs who used it for investment properties. He completely abolished taxes on one of Greece's staples like olive oil. There was compulsory arbitration for disputes. And the eight-hour working day was actually enforced. They didn't just go to a salary as a way to get around it. And Social Security, which was in 1934, um, some of the reasons that unemployment was reduced to almost zero. The Workers Center was an organization that was founded uh, with the cooperation of the different corporations to match the right person to the right vocation. It's always been my contention that the key to happiness is to know why you're here. What is that one thing that makes you who you are? What is that one work that one labor, that one career that you would die for, that you would live in poverty for? How can you contribute to the society to be more than just some abstract individual? Well, I know what mine is. You find out what yours is, and you'll really enjoy waking up in the morning. The national body was absolutely essential to um, to metoxas. The national body was a religious body. Nations are created by religion. Culture comes from the cult. Here's what Metoxas says about this question. In the West, there's a total separation between church and state. The church is denied a role in education. But here in Greece, church and nation constitute one whole. The Greek nation, the Greek church, share the same history since the rise of Christianity. The state in Greece never dared to seek anti-religious aim. Even the parliament of 1927, when there was such an inclination, didn't dare undermine the special position of the Orthodox Church. So that one of the conditions that gave rise to the 4th of August regime was the period of irreligion preceding it. But now, family, nation, and church are the new pillars of Greek society, nation and state. State and church work, each in its own way, towards the same national goals. In these circumstances, The state has a right to interfere in the education of children for national purposes. School, parents, the youth groups, and the state are all involved in this important national endeavor. 
Today, you'll be strung up for saying this at a university. But this is simply how human beings are. This isn't really a political theory. It's simply a description of human nature. Toxus, needless to say, came against a, a tremendous opposition. Um, but more than anything else, despoiling the old oligarchy, despoiling the old uh, creditor class, forgiving debt, refusing to pay these debts uh, uh, taken out um, by the Masonic regime. We just we just heard his quote where there was under Venezuelos and his friends an attempt to remove the church from public life, to completely denationalize Greece. Farmers found themselves without debts anymore, and they were able to buy out their tenancies with cheap state loans. They became, it became a smallholder state. Intensive cultivation was promoted. You know, Greece doesn't have a lot of arable land. It certainly has, you know, vineyards and, and, and trees. Um, but arable land is few and far between. So the nature of intensive cultivation is extremely important. But wheat production then rose from 531,000 tons to almost a million tons between 1936 and 1938. 1939, Greece was producing enough to meet 60% of its domestic consumption needs. That's extraordinary for a country that's pretty much rocks without tons of arable land. That means the level of, of efficiency was extraordinary. But taxes, um, reforms, and the corporate state, even though it wasn't even fully implemented, worked very, very well. Exports in 1938 rose by more than 50% over the previous year. It was a massive explosion of economic activity. Currency reserves grew. Greece's merchant shipping tonnage hit almost 2 million tons. And under Metaxas, Greece became the world's ninth biggest commercial maritime power. Industrial output increased the staggering 180% in that same period of time. The same for the production of electricity. As a result, the population grew. And the construction, transport, agricultural, textile industry, even engineering, brought in uh, these refugees, Greek refugees from elsewhere, and educated them in the corporation was essential to this. The first two years of a toxic government, overall economic activity grew by 138%. You don't see these numbers anywhere else. You know, Hitler's Germany had numbers like this. This is what happens when a worker realizes that he has a state behind him, or he has a corporation that's always going to protect him. He matters now. He's not just some faceless mass you can manipulate. It's the only way that a man could actually be a man. When a worker signs a contract with a big corporation, it's not a valid contract. How could it be? There are very few jobs left. Every, all the power is on the side of the of the employer. It's is a coercive contract. It's something that's simply forced upon you because of the the dearth of jobs, the destruction of your economy. National socialism is a corporate state. The corporate state is based on the notion of individual fitting in with society. That you have a specific vocation, something that makes you very happy, something that you can make a living from, something that is necessary for the society. Some area, some vocation, some career. You know, you have jobs, you have careers, and you have vocations. Very, very different things. The job is what you get because you have no you need to pay the bills. A career is a long term investment, but you know, you can live without it. A vocation is your life. The corporation is about manifesting that. It's about taking an abstract individual and making him a citizen. He's a citizen because as a part of the corporation, he's able to contribute to the society. 
Otherwise, he's absolutely nothing. It works. Socialism and its uh, materialist sign has been tried a thousand times and failed miserably. Nationalism and corporatism, wherever it's been tried, in Portugal, in Spain, in Greece, in Romania briefly, in Germany, has wildly succeeded. The debate is over. This is what Metoxas is. This is the greatness of this man and one of the reasons that many people, even Orthodox people, have never heard of him. He lived and died in a pious Orthodox man, an Orthodox struggler, and corporatism, because to a great extent, follows the law of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Of course, it has to be updated for, for our days, but still, the same spirit is present. This is the Christian political thought. This is Christian political uh, ideology. I wanted to get into the um, Greco-Italian War, which is actually somewhat humorous. Um, well, let me give you the short version. Mussolini makes a fool of himself and uh, is, is an absolute, absolute joke. All right, that's pretty much it. Um, thank you, everyone, for listening. I uh, will talk to you next time. Bye-bye.